Good morning and welcome to the 14th meeting of the Local Government Housing and Planning Committee in 2021. I'd like to ask all members and witnesses to ensure their mobile phones are on silent and all other notifications are turned off during the meeting. Our first item this morning is consideration of whether to take item four in private. Item four will be an opportunity for members to reflect on the evidence that they have heard earlier in the meeting on short-term lets. Do members agree to take item four in private? Agreed. And that's all agreed. The second item on our agenda today is to take evidence as part of the committee's work on short-term lets. This will be the first of three evidence panels over the next three weeks. At today's meeting, the committee will hear from organisations opposed to the approach taken by the Scottish Government to the regulation of short-term lets. And I would like to welcome to the committee Fiona Campbell, who's the Chief, Chief Executive of the Association of Scotland's Self-Caterers, David Weston, the Chair of the Scottish Bed and Breakfast Association, Amanda Couples, General Manager for, the North, Northern, uh, for Northern Europe Airbnb, and Sean McPanda, Director General of the UK Short-Term Accommodation Association. Thank you for joining us today. We had also hoped to hear from Highland Council this morning too, but unfortunately they were unable to field anyone today. We'll move straight to questions. Witnesses, if you wish to respond or contribute to this discussion, please add an R to the chat box to indicate this. And I'd just like to add that we will try to direct our questions to specific people. And just in the interest of time, if you can come in, if you just feel like a perspective you want to get across hasn't been already uh, raised, that would, be, that would be very good. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to take the first question. Uh, many tourism and hospitality businesses such as taxis, pubs, restaurants and coach operators are subject to licensing regimes for the benefit of both users and communities. Can you explain why you think short-term lets should be exempt from licensing? And I'd love to hear from Amanda and then David. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I think we would start by saying not that we are opposed to regulation, it's that we are specifically opposed to licensing. And the reason that we are opposed as Airbnb on behalf of our hosts is fundamentally we believe the licensing system as tabled is disproportionate um, and, and overly burdensome given the nature, the level of activity that hosts on Airbnb Scotland um, carry out. Just to give you um, a sort of snapshot of the host community on Airbnb in Scotland, around 83% of hosts in Scotland on Airbnb host uh, one listing only, and they on average host for less than four nights per calendar month. This is not a highly professionalised um, megacorp kind of conglomerate of hosts. These are ordinary, everyday Scottish people um, who use the income from Air hosting on Airbnb as an economic lifeline. Many of these hosts rent a space in their own house. This is their primary residence. Um, licensing um, and being, forcing them to comply with licensing would effectively make their primary residence a licensed pre premise. We think that's inappropriate. Um, we also believe um, that, and we, we see this when we go around the country and talk to hosts, it's simply too burdensome, too expensive, and many hosts will simply um, withdraw their properties, both from the short-term letting market, but also the long-term letting market. There are no winners in this. The tourism industry doesn't benefit, the housing industry doesn't benefit, and most of all, we have removed the ability of these hard-working, everyday Scottish people, many of whom live in rural communities where tourism is an absolutely vital part of economic empowerment of the, of the region. We have removed their ability to be able to support themselves. Almost 40% of hosts on Airbnb do use the income from hosting to actually cover their monthly household expenses. As I said, we're not against regulation per se. We've been very proactive in calling for registration systems. We believe um, that they are a necessary part of short-term letting regulation. Um, we believe they're proportionate, they get the job done, and they give 
regulators and local authorities they, the tools they need to make decisions on short-term regulation. But this licensing system is not it from our perspective. Okay, thank you for that. And um, can we hear from David? Um, and also just to say that we do have time, but try to keep your answers um, to the point. Thank you. Yeah, yes, uh, I'd echo a lot of uh, what the previous speaker said and emphasize that B&Bs uh, are very small businesses, micro businesses. 77% um, of our members have uh, between one and six letting bedrooms. So they're, they're very small businesses. Uh, just to give you an example, a typical uh, three-bedroom B&B at the average occupancy rate in 19, 2019, which is 50 percent, charging £65 a room, will have total gross turnover of 35,600 a year. That's, that's not income, that's gross turnover. Uh, all the costs have got to come off that, and that usually represents livelihood for uh, two people. So we're talking about very small businesses. Uh, the question uh, uh, asked about um, shouldn't what's wrong with licensing if they're licensing in other areas. I think in some other areas, licensing is there from historical reasons. It might not necessarily always be uh, be thought appropriate if it was starting now. I think the key thing in, in, in our sector is to look at the facts in our actual sector and to see if licensing is appropriate. And we, as with the previous speaker, the Scottish Bed and Breakfast Association and our colleagues at the UK uh, Association, have long said that we would be in favour of levelling the playing field, in other words, having uh, more regulation on our sector to, to protect guests in the same way wh wherever they're staying in tourism accommodation. But we think that can be achieved as it is all uh, many, many countries in the world by a registration scheme, a low, low cost or no cost, light touch registration scheme. Exam there are many examples. Portugal has one, which is a simple online registration scheme. Uh, so that is what we and other colleagues proposed at the working group um, to overlay on the licensing scheme, a registration scheme, uh, which would be a way we think of making it less onerous on very tiny uh, businesses uh, and achieving what the Scottish Government wants to achieve, which is the uh, health and safety, uh, minimum health and safety requirements uh, complied with by all tourism accommodation, which we fully support that as an aim. But we think the, the way this is being proposed at the moment with a licensing scheme is unduly onerous and costly. Thank you, David. And I believe Fiona would like to come in. Thanks very much. And thank you very much indeed for giving us the opportunity to give evidence today. I think I absolutely concur with Amanda and David. What really needs to be remembered here is that professional operators are already regulated. So the mandatory, mandatory conditions of this licensing scheme are essentially duplication and therefore we would suggest unnecessary. This Association for Scotland Self Caterers is not anti regulation, but we are absolutely against disproportionate regulation that's going to risk jobs and damage Scottish tourism. We've constructively engaged with the Scottish Government for years, and in fact, in 2017, actively encouraged and asked for a registration scheme in order to make sure that all accommodation providers do indeed meet the existing regulations to do with health and safety. But also, we've got to remember, like, since the rationale behind introducing licences is apparently compliance with basic, basic health and safety, why are hotels, serviced accommodations and so on and so forth exempt? Because whilst they're licensed, they're actually licensed to serve alcohol, not on the basis of health and safety. So, you know, we, we really desperately want to get the regulatory framework in place right that works for everybody and is, it gives a balance between tourism, business and also local communities. But notification and registration is so much better and has proved to be so much better across the globe than licensing, which is an authorization scheme. And I think what's, you know, 
we have to look at this licensing scheme and ask, is it really underpinned by necessity, justification, proportionality and non-discrimination? And my answer to that would unfortunately be no, it is not. Thank you, Fiona. And I believe Sean Mick would like to come in as well. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to, to speak to you today. Um, I'd like to concur also with what uh, the previous speakers have said, and we're absolutely pro, you know, regulations, sensible and proportionate regulation for this sector. I think this is about just trying to make sure that we come up with something proportionate, justified and necessary. Um, just in addition to what the previous speakers have said around um, this proposed regulation being too onerous and too costly, um, with the sort of potential effect of freezing out a number of different hosts and small businesses from the sector. I would like to mention just a couple of other issues with the with the licensing. First of all, I think it's 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 too restrictive in the sense that the licensing scheme assumes uh, would essentially close the market and then open up the opportunity to certain individuals or businesses that wish to do this afterwards. Whereas a much more proportionate way of doing it would be to keep the market open and then to restrict it when necessary if there is evidence of a particular problem that we believe is a much more sensible and proportionate way of doing things. I'd also like to raise the issue of regulatory fragmentation. Um, it, the powers that are given to local authorities here to overlay the licensing conditions with um, with its own condition with its own um, rules and regulations means that essentially all local authorities um, could come up with a, a separate regime um, for regulating short lets, which makes it very diff difficult for operators and um, professional operators to work at scale. Um, it's also very difficult for newcomers to understand what the rules are and to comply with the standards from, um, you know, from one, regi one um, authority to the next. And there's a very basic question here. Why um, would it be? Why should safety standards be different in Edinburgh versus safety standards in the Highlands? Surely they should be the same, and it would get rid of a whole load of complexity if we could have one regime here um, for um, for the whole of the country. Lastly, I'd just like to add that it creates a lot of uncertainty for businesses in the sense that local authorities can determine a length of a license after the initial three-year period and there is no automatic renewal process. That means it's very hard to plan because you don't know how long you're going to get a license for in the future, and it will basically starve investment into the sector because those who want to invest in keeping up good properties and making sure that the property stock is, is um, fit for tourists to come to Scotland will be disincentivized from doing so. Um, so in some, I just think there's a, a number of problems with the legislation. I agree that registration is a much more sensible way of doing this with some additional conditions around health and safety, perhaps through accreditation, which I'm happy to talk to. The consequences of this is that host small businesses will drop out of the sector. The Scottish economy will suffer because jobs will go. Um, and tourism accommodation stock will also um, change in the sense that the variety will go. Um, and this is not good for the environment because you'll just have to build a new hotel stock instead if you're going to freeze these, um, these, these um, if you're going to st stop these sort of types of properties from being able to let, let out. So we think that there's sort of distortions that will come from this which need to be considered. Thanks. Thank you very much for sharing your uh, perspective there. I'm um, going to move on to uh, the next question. Concerns have been raised about uncertainty and the associated impact on future bookings caused by the need to obtain and renew a short-term let license, which some of you have already expressed. What is the source of these concerns? Do you have any evidence of significant business disruptions caused by license renewal in other licensed industries? And perhaps we could hear from... Fiona and then Shomak on this. Um, I'm so sorry, we actually lost sound at the beginning of that. Um, would you be able to just repeat yep. the first Absolutely, part of that yes. question? Absolutely, yes. We're used to the tech Before. thing. Don't worry. No, no need to be. There, we need to never be sorry in the technical realm because there's always these tech glitches. Concerns have been raised about uncertainty and the associated impact on future bookings caused by the need to obtain and renew a short-term let license, which some of you have already expressed. 
What is the source of these concerns? Do you have any evidence of significant business disruption caused by license renewal in other licensed industries? Thank you. Yeah, indeed. Well, I, I, unfortunately, you know, having poured over the complexities and the detail of the proposed licensing legislation, and I will happily follow this up with um, um, a slightly more detailed explanation in, in writing post after this event, if that's okay, because it is incredibly complex. Um, it, the, the uncertainty is really impossible for smaller micro businesses. You know, I, I've been doing this as a business for 20 years, and I find it hard to understand how the civil servants that have, have produced this licensing legislation um, feel that they know how we run our businesses better than we do. Now, this comes down to everything from fees. How much is it going to cost? Totally unnecessarily to tick a box to say that we already comply with existing health and safety legislation. Will we get charged more because we accommodate more guests? How are local authorities indeed going to set the fees, given that they've got no idea how many premises will need to be licensed? In terms of fees, it's really impossible. Any fee that's going to be added to the existing cost of doing business is simply going to be untenable for small businesses, especially in light of the global pandemic with huge increases in energy prices, services and consumables. We've been given a kind of indicative fee of um, around 300, 400 pounds, but Solar and many local authorities have already contested that fee and are saying that it's going to be more like 1,500 to 2,000, which would be crippling for small businesses. But then you move on to the uncertainty about how we run the business. How can we accept future bookings when we might have our, our license revoked or refused for some reason? Licensing may not even be on a 36 month basis in some local authorities for some reason, but a 36 month basic turnaround for licensing is impossible. Guests simply won't book into the future if there's a possibility that a license may be refused or revoked. And then, you know, I've been talking to mortgage providers. What happens when our mortgage provider pulls our financial support because of that uncertainty or where a material change has been in circumstance? The Breer refutes that that would occur, but they haven't spoken to these financial institutions. I have, and they have said that they will actively start looking at whether it is viable to offer mortgages or financial support for our sector. And that goes back to what Shomik said. You know, we are going to start having to really look at whether we're going to invest in our businesses because we won't necessarily have that financial support behind us. Okay. And then, of course, you've got neighbour objections. What happens if a vexatious neighbour complains about the activity? I mean, we've got one. I've experienced this. He assaulted me in 2018 because we operate a self-catering property near his house, despite the fact that he's never had any problems associated with that activity. Now, he's got a criminal record. I've got PTSE. But I assume that when I apply for a licence for that property, he's going to complain. Now, will a licence be refused on those grounds? Are we going to lose our business because of nimbyism? We just don't know. And, you know, there's been a, a okay, brilliant okay, thank narrative. You, thank that, you, Fiona. Um, I just want to um, really, you know, let time for other questions. We've got quite a few questions to get through. And um, I also want to hear other perspectives. So maybe, Shomak, if you have anything new and different to add to what Fiona's been saying on specifically on what is the source of the concerns and uh, do you have any evidence of significant business disruption caused by lic license renewal in other licensed industries or uh, licensing of short-term lets in other countries, perhaps? Uh, yeah, I, I'll try and keep it brief. Um, so I think um, the concerns are probably twofold. On, from the operator's perspective, obviously we've said that the, I think the fees could well be disproportionately high versus the income received, which will be problematic. I think it will take a lot of stock out of the market. But I think I'd also like to talk about what the impact here is on local authorities, because if local authorities are having to um, administer this scheme, there are going to be large upfront costs around enforcement. And it's not very clear where this funding is going to come from and how they're going to manage to actually administer this scheme. And this brings me to the, the, the question that you asked, is that what experiences have we seen elsewhere which might be problematic when licensing schemes have been introduced. And I can recall the scheme that was brought into Berlin um, and certain districts in Berlin a few years back. Uh, essentially what happens is that local authorities 
don't bring forward the license um, applications and essentially don't, it, it, they become de facto bans, right? Because it's, it's quite costly to process and they'd rather not deal with them. And it, essentially that's a, a key reason here why we don't like licensing because it gives um, an opportunity for de facto bans to emerge when you know really it should be most people's right to be able to um, and businesses rights to be able to uh, let out their properties. Thank you very much for that and I believe that David would like to also come in on this and then I'm going to bring Megan Gallagher in with a supplementary. Yes thank you. Uh, I think uh, this question about licensing in other uh, areas a, I think that, that you will find if you spoke, speak to uh, representatives of other uh, industries that there are such problems in, in other areas. I can't speak for that because we're, we're, we're obviously in our sector. But B, more importantly, this is uh, in, other areas of licensing have uh, had many, many years to bed in and for people to understand them, particularly the alcohol licensing. Uh, issues and even then uh, it, problems arise when anything has changed. In this instance the Scottish Government is imposing all at once a complete industry-wide licensing scheme from scratch and that is a very very risky uh, thing to do and these kind of problems that we've been talking about uh, don't have to be very large in percentage terms to cause a huge problem to the Scottish uh, tourism economy and as the minister Mr McKee said uh, the other day 24th of November at the Scottish tourism conference he said tourism recovery is critical to the Scottish economy and I, I totally agree with that. Thank you very much and now I'd like to bring in Megan with a question. Thank you, convener, and good morning, panel. Um, before I ask my question this morning, I would like to refer members to my register of interests, as I am a serving councillor in North Lanarkshire. Um, and my question relates to the tourism question that the convener asked um, just moments ago. Um, and my question is um, that I've heard concerns that the proposed licensing scheme could have a damaging impact as businesses try to recover from the pandemic with many relying on tourism at home and the tourism industry to give their businesses a boost. And I would be interested to hear the panel's concerns regarding the timing of the legislation and any lasting impacts this could have on businesses across the sector. And if I could start with um, Fiona, please. Thanks very much. Well, absolutely. I mean, our, our sector alone, the self-catering sector, represents £867 million to the Scottish economy with 24,000 jobs. Um, we've all gone through a harrowing time, as we all know. And we really, I think it's absolutely essential that policymakers reflect on that and understand that we need to support small businesses and micro businesses as we come out of the pandemic. We're not even out of survival mode, realistically. We need to be able to recover. And this, unfortunately, this licensing legislation is going to be hugely damaging to Scottish economy, to the Scottish tourism economy. And we really need to reflect on that. We need to support small businesses, these micro businesses. It's people's lives and livelihoods that I represent. It's not their hobby. These aren't casual hosts who also rely on their assets to make them the much needed additional money. But I'm representing these people, thousands and thousands of businesses that they rely on this income. That's their livelihoods. And we need to support those livelihoods as we appear from the um, pandemic. Thank you. And Amanda would like to come in on this as well. Thank you very much. Um, I would very much echo a lot of what Fiona said. Um, most of those messages are equally applicable to the, um, to the everyday Scottish people that make up the bulk of the hosting community on Airbnb in Scotland. Um, just to give you a few data points, uh, we have commissioned independent economic research hosting on Airbnb um, delivers around £677 million pounds of gross value added um, and supports around 33,500 jobs. Um, that same modelling uh, estimates that if these proposals were to be implemented now, um, around half of those jobs um, would go away and they would cost the Scottish economy approximately a million pounds a day. This is a big deal from an economic point of view. And again, I would, I would emphasise what Fiona said about the impact on ordinary everyday people for whom tourism is 
not only an economic lifeline, but really in some communities, the only way they have to actually support themselves. Um, again, I would point to some of the more rural communities. I speak to a lot of hosts. Um, many of them tell me stories along the lines of, you know, hosting on Airbnb enables me to stay in the village or in the community that I grow up in. Um, it provides employment for families. It supports the village pub staying open. Um, these things will go, um, it, and, and that is what our hosts are telling us consistently around Scotland. There is economic impact, but there is also people's lives that will be damaged by this. As Fiona said, um, we are not out of this pandemic yet by any stretch of the imagination. I wish we were. Um, tourism remains in a very, very fragile place. Um, and from our perspective, we really would just emphasise the need to, at this particular time, be as supportive of Scottish tourism as ever before. And it's our belief that these proposals are not that. Thank you, Amanda. I'm now going to come to questions from Eleanor Whittam. Thank you very much, convener, and good morning to the panel. Before I ask my questions, I would just refer everyone to my register of interests. I am an existing councillor in East Ayrshire Council. Um, so the first question I have is, um, what are your views on the changes made by, uh, to the draft licensing order from the version presented to our predecessor committee in February? And I would perhaps like to start with Shomak first. Uh, hi there. Thank you very much for the question. Um, well, look, obviously, we're happy that some improvements have been made um, to the previous version, but um, I think the, the main thrust is that our concern is really over the licensing scheme as a whole, and those larger concerns have not been uh, removed. And we think that, you know, tweaking the scheme, uh, I mean, essentially the concessions that have been made are, are some positive but, tweaks, but they are just that, they're tweaks. We really need, a, I think, a fundamental overhaul of the thought of what, what is an appropriate system for, for Scotland at this point, not, taking into account not just the, the effects of the pandemic and the uh, impact on businesses at this moment when they are already beaten down quite significantly in the hospitality sector, but just in the longer term, you know, as we think about a regulatory regime that's fit for the 21st century, something that's simple, that's online, that's easy for people to understand, um, that really keeps the market open and restricts it on a, flexibly when, when necessary. We think licensing is not the right way forward and you have an opportunity to rethink this now. And that's what we'd like to push today, I think, is that you give it a little bit extra thought to see whether a more slimline registration scheme would be more appropriate for you to first get the data. That will allow you to get the data in terms of what, who is doing this, if there are any uh, problems, you'll be able to then enforce against them. And if you are, once you've got the data, you'll be able to analyze whether there are any specific problems where you need to legislate further. But we think that's the appropriate step at this stage, rather than a licensing scheme that will shut the market off um, for no, no good reason. Thank you very much um, for that answer. Could I also perhaps hear from Fiona on that? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I absolutely concur with what Shomix just said. Um, we, we welcomed some of the concessions made um, on the 7th of October, but actually when you look at the detail of them, they don't go far enough. Even the over-provision, which was the most welcome withdrawal um, as part of that statement, uh, actually when you look into it, it's still in there. So there are powers for licensing to um, allow over-provision, and that's incredibly worrying for operators of bona fide legitimate businesses as well as casual hosts. Um, absolutely can go with what Shomik said and again we as a sector have provided alternative options that we believe truly believe are proportionate and workable and targeted solutions and if they don't work absolutely let's revisit it in a few years once we've got that data but we need the data before we can make proper you know sensible policy decisions rather than um, introducing this incredibly burdensome, incredibly onerous, onerous uh, scheme, which is, as, as people have said before, going to have a huge impact on local authorities who, again, have been massively hit by the pandemic and simply do not have the resource and have quite openly said that they don't have the resource to de deliver this licensing scheme as proposed. 
Many thanks. Um, I, I do have another question that I would perhaps like to direct to David. It has been argued um, that traditional B&B should be exempt from any such licensing scheme. How would this actually be um, done in practice, um, considering that it could create a loophole where the provision of a breakfast um, actually might be um, what somebody could do to avoid the need to obtain a licence? Uh, we, well, we've always been surprised that B and traditional B&Bs were included in this uh, scheme, and I think there was our surprise was shared by um, many uh, within government circles as well, uh, in my opinion, um, because as everybody seems to agree, traditional B&Bs uh, are not the source of a lot of the problems that this legislation seeks to address. We're already compliant with uh, health and safety legislation, and there are already mechanisms to enforce that uh, on uh, B&Bs. So our view was that um, the playing field can be levelled. In other words, the, the, the existing legislation applied and enforced to all tourism accommodation um, by having a, a simple low-cost registration scheme. Um, so we are not um, specifically saying that B and B should simply be excluded from it. That uh, from this legislation, what, what, what we're saying is that uh, a, an accommodation registration scheme would be fairer and proportionate and would cover everybody and there wouldn't be the, the, those loopholes you suggest. And I would just emphasize, and it hasn't been much mentioned so far, it's been mentioned by a couple of my um, fellow uh, panelists, that, that the importance of having a digital scheme, a, a simple uh, scheme that works in the digital sphere, because even with um, B&Bs now, the reality of our, uh, of the tourism world is that many bookings are online, a growing proportion of bookings are online, many through platforms, even for tiny B&Bs. And the, the, so to have a licensing scheme that works in the real world means that you're going to have a, something that must be digitally uh, enabled so that it works on a simple license number or registration number. Um, and that is been uh, found to, to work in practice in many other countries. So I just wanted to emphasize that point about digital uh, uh, consistency and how the, the modern tourism economy works, even for B&Bs. Many thanks. Thank you for that. I'm now going to come to questions from Willie Coffey. Thank you, convener, and good morning to the panel. I have a couple of questions for you. One, just to continue the the discussion on the impact on the rural communities and another on costs, likely costs that might come up. Firstly, uh, the impact on rural communities. What do you think um, about this in terms of the impact on, say, a small uh, rural business in southwest Scotland or the Highlands, say, compared to the city of Edinburgh? Do you think the proposed licence scheme should in fact be the same and is it applicable in both locations and circumstances? Um, maybe David and Amanda could start and offer an answer on that, please. Well, thank you. Yes, well, certainly B&Bs and guest houses are particularly important to the Scottish economy in rural and coastal areas, highlands and islands, because we tend to be the only type of accommodation uh, in some of those areas, and, and professional self-caterers as well. There, what I'm saying is there aren't big hotels in a lot of those locations. So the tourism accommodation is small-scale accommodation like B&Bs, guest houses, uh, professional self-caterers. So th that's particularly important when you think that spend, um, the average spend at a B&B um, for, for international visitors is £498. Um, for domestic visitors, two hundred and ninety-four pounds. Uh, 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 then there's the the additional spend uh, uh, as well, and that all trickles into that local economy, to the local pub, um, the local shops, uh, farmers, and all the, the the food suppliers. So that is very important for the 
fragile economies in, in uh, rural and coastal areas of, of the country. Um, and we're already seeing anecdotally comments of, from members saying that if these things come in, they'll, they'll, they'll give up. Uh, we've, there's been surveys, which you, I'm, I'm sure you, the, the committee have seen about numbers of people, small businesses that say they may uh, discontinue were, uh, it, were these things to be introduced. Um, and even the threat of licensing scheme possibly happening over the next two, three, four years uh, will ha would have a, a depressing effect on the tourism economy and people who would have started businesses or invested in them may decide not to do so. Uh, so I think, yes, there will be a disproportionate effect on the rural and coastal economy in highlands and islands. Um, Amanda? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I would echo a lot of what David um, has said in terms of what we're hearing from hosts on Airbnb. Our rural hosts um, tell us consistently that um, hosting on Airbnb is the way that they um, make ends meet. It is an economic lifeline for them. And in many of those rural communities, without tourism, the communities themselves just simply don't exist. Um, I think we also need to think about, and, and of course this is speculation, but it is our view that if you think about the costs of licensing for those hosts um, who haven't given up and taken their properties off the market, um, it's quite likely that the cost of compliance with licensing will be passed on to the end consumer. And of course that will have the impact of driving up prices um, and, and potentially the impact of making Scotland less competitive as a destination versus you know, many of the, um, the other options, particularly in those rural communities, this will have a negative effect on the tourism economy. Uh, I also just wanted to flag um, that while I agree with the statement that, that perhaps in some ways you know, the impact on a licensing system on, on the rural communities versus cities is different, I wouldn't necessarily go so far as to say um, one is more important than the other. Um, I would in particular point to, you know, Edinburgh and Glasgow, to major cities um, and the role of short-term accommodation uh, in effectively providing a flexible, scalable solution in terms of when those cities host um, major events. This is, not, um, this is not something that the hotel or traditional hospitality industry can easily flex, solve. Um, I'd point as an example to um, there was a festival, music festival called Transmit that happened in Glasgow for the first time this year. 150,000 people turned up. There were no camping facilities and the official accommodation partner was the Hilton Hotel. Um, we know that Glasgow has around 15,000, um, a capacity of around 15,000 people. In those instances, um, small short-term letting operators are actually enabling those events to happen in those places and again delivering huge economic be benefits to those cities. So I would just remind the committee that short-term letting, you know, particularly as we move to a world in which we are increasingly making sure that how we travel and how we invest in infrastructure is sustainable, short-term letting has an important role to play in delivering economic benefits to cities as well as rural areas. Okay, thank you for that. I wonder if I could ask the second question, convener on the cost issue that's been raised several times by some of our panellists. Um, the information we have in front of us is an indicative uh, suggested cost of between £200 and £400 for a three-year licence. And Fiona, during your contribution, you, you indicated that it could, in fact, be much higher. But if we start at the figures that we have in front of us, that would work out at roughly £1.30 to £2.60 per week, if we believe those figures. Could you share with us your thoughts on why you think those figures would be much, much higher than that? And what discussions have you had, if any, with the local authorities who would have the discretion, as I understand it, to introduce the actual fee? Thanks so much. And absolutely, if you're looking at those indicative figures as the correct figures, then that's really not something to be particularly concerned with. The problem is that from everybody that we've spoken to, from representatives from Solar to also the many local authorities that we've spoken to, 
they suggest that it's going to be much more akin to an HMO license, which ranges from about 1,500 to 2,000 pounds. Now that is a huge amount for a small micro business. That really is, is, is untenable to add that as, a, as an additional cost of doing business, but is unnecessary for those businesses that are already regulated and already cover, covered by um, health and safety legislation. So we already have huge costs associated with complying with that existing legislation. So this cost of license just seems like an unnecessary expense. So I think what we're concerned about is the uncertainty. Now, as we understand it, that indicative fee is based on the number of 32,000 Airbnb listings in 2019, um, and that is divided by, and um, the example is made of a two bedroom property, a two bedroom tenement flat, for example, in Edinburgh, that's as we understand it. Now, if that's gonna be scaled up, depending on the activity, the size of the activity, et cetera, the type of short-term let, um, we have no idea what that's going to look like. So how much is a five-bedroom house in Argyll and Butte going to be charged compared to that two-bedroom property in Edinburgh? We just don't know is the problem. And the fact that Solar and local authorities are refuting that it is ever going to be possible to deliver this scheme on that lower fee, we have to be concerned that the BRIA has just simply not got it right. And the other thing is, as I mentioned before, is local authorities are going to find it incredibly difficult to know how, what fee to set if they have no idea how many numbers of premises are going to be, have to be licensed. They're also going to have no idea how many members of staff they're going to need to deliver that licensing scheme. So it's really hard for them to front load that expenditure and also divide that by the number to get the appropriate fee. So the uncertainty is more damaging and dangerous than perhaps anything else. But I think it's really important that we get to the bottom of those fee levels before we start thinking that this is in any way a sensible option. Exactly. Whereas you compare that to registration for private landlords, which is £82 for a register. Thank you for that, Fiona. Are there any other contributions from uh, David, Amanda and Shomik on, on the licensing fee issue that Fiona hasn't already shared? <laughs> David? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I'd, echo what, I'd echo what Fiona just said and also say that you, you mentioned um, that local authorities would have discretion. Uh, they, as I understand it, would have been mandated by law to have full cost recovery on their costs. Uh, so they would, uh, quite understandably, in the situation they're in, of, of the financial situation they're in, um, have to look at the cost of, of administering this scheme and make sure that's fully charged across the tiny businesses, micro businesses that are uh, going to be licensed. So our fear is that that full cost recovery model would uh, would make the license fees very disproportionate to micro businesses and more like the, the, the other fees in other areas, uh, HMOs and things that have, have been mentioned. Also, the other issue is inconsistency and unfairness. Uh, why, why, why would it be f fair that uh, a two-bedroom B&B in one local authority area may pay hundreds of pounds differently than a two-bedroom B&B in another local authority area? Um, I understand how that would happen if these were if these proposals were implemented, but. Uh, it, it, it just would arrive, give unfairness and inconsistency, uh, and which wouldn't be a factor in a Scotland-wide registration scheme. Thank you, David. Um, Amanda? Shomak. Perhaps Shomak could offer a contribution. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, <clears throat> And just I can, can concur with um, both David and Fiona and everything they've said. I just had one more point. I mean, you mentioned it's only one pound thirty-six a week, and it sounds very reasonable when you put it that way. But it's actually the nature of the front loading here, the one-off cost at the beginning, which is actually quite a significant amount. And if you consider those who are doing it just for three, four, five, six weeks in a year, maybe when they go away, uh, or if they've got family in another place, or they have a seasonal job and their home is lying empty for a little while. These folks 
um, you know, will not make that money back through their profitability um, to make such a license worthwhile. So they will simply drop out of the market. Um, so I just wanted to make those use cases um, uh, available to you so you could consider those as well. Okay, thank you everybody for your comments, thank you. Thank you, Willie. Um, I'd just like to come in on a supplementary uh, from Willie, just picking up around the kind of rural issues. So the survey responses submitted to this committee raised concerns that the proposed legislation was designed to tackle issues experienced principally in central Edinburgh. Considering this, I'd like to hear your views on how short-term lets and housing demands interact in a rural and island context. And I'd love to hear from David and then Fiona. So specifically around the issue of short-term lets and housing in rural and island context. Uh, do, do you mean that how it would specific how it would disproportionately affect uh, small businesses like B&Bs in those rural areas? What we're hearing is is that there are housing challenges, and I would just like to hear if, if you have a perspective on that in rural areas. Yes. Well, in 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 general, uh, there a comment to make is that uh, which nobody's made so far is that. Uh, Yes, there are housing issues in Scotland and in particular in in Edinburgh that are real, very real issues in affordable housing availability and, and other uh, issues like that. And nobody's denying that those are very real issues. Um, I think some people uh, imagine that this, uh, the proposals before the committee today would help solve some of those housing uh, issues but they certainly would not and 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 certainly the existence and business of small b and b's uh, uh, and whether they should pay uh, licensing fees and have a licensing scheme imposed on them will not in any way alleviate um, housing issues in any areas of Scotland thank you and um and Fiona, what are your thoughts on particularly the rural and the islands uh, housing issue that I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on? Yeah, I, I think I think what we really need to be clear about here is that this discussion is that licensing deals with health and safety, not housing, as a over provision powers have already been removed. But also the short term let planning control area legislation was already passed in February 2021 as part of the Planning Act 2019. And that is solely related to the use of the property. They're two completely different pieces of legislation with dealing with completely different issues. And actually, neither of those pieces of legislation is in any way going to ameliorate the issue of second homes. A lot of professional self caterers and indeed B&Bs um, have come in, people have come in and invested heavily in rural and island areas to properties that wouldn't necessarily be bought by local indigenous folk and, and made an amazing contribution to that local community. But nonetheless, there's, there's absolutely no empirical data whatsoever which demonstrates a link between short-term lets and the housing market. Moreover, we know that there are five times as many empty homes in Scotland than there are self-catering units. So I think we need to remember that there's two different pieces of legislation here. And this piece of licensing legislation, we have been told by the Scottish government numerous times now, is about health and safety and not housing. Thank you for that. I'm going to move on with questions from Miles Briggs. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Good morning to the panel. Thank you for joining us today. Um, <clears throat> a number of you have touched upon already um, the impact that um, you believe this will have on the sector. So I just wondered if you could outline to us um, what sort of numbers you would expect uh, to be leaving um, the sector if this gets brought forward and whether or not um, in other countries, for example, a few people have touched upon uh, the scheme in Portugal, um, how that's impacted as well. Um, I'll maybe start with uh, Fiona and if anyone wants to put an R in the chat, we can bring you in. Thanks very much indeed. Well, it's interesting. We've run a, f a few surveys and um, we've based it on, on the existing proposals of the licensing schemes. And in 2020, 49% of our professional sector said that they would uh, remove themselves from the sector if this licensing scheme um, was introduced. That increased in September 2021 to 55%. So that's 55% of 867 million pounds to the Scottish economy that may well withdraw from the sector. 
that's hugely, hugely concerning. If you look at how licensing has impacted on somewhere like Ireland, where they have indeed introduced a licensing and used it as a de facto ban in some city centre areas, that, that's, that sector has been decimated, absolutely decimated, because people do not get the licences. Now, conversely, if you look at Portugal, which is a very proportionate, it's best practice across the whole of the EU and possibly the world, that gives people, it gives local authorities the data to enable them to understand the scale of the activity. It ensures the health and safety of the activity. And then what they've done is they've introduced licensing in areas of demonstrable link between short-term letting and housing stock. It, it basically, it enables the activity to continue in a sustainable fashion. So I would just really urge the committee to look at those best practice examples. Again, we've given examples of them over the years through our constructive collaboration with the working group and its predecessor, the delivery group, and look at those best practice examples and, and make Scotland better than those best practice examples. We have the opportunity to be world leading in line with the Scottish Tourism Outlook 2030 aspiration to be world class in the 21st century. So, you know, we have evidence that strong licensing has a crippling impact on tourism economies in the world. And we have examples of best practice where it enables sustain, sustainable growth of the sector. Um, and Amanda, do you want to come in as well? On... Yes, just very briefly, um, just to give you the, the sort of perspective from, from, from our patch, very actually very consistent with what Fiona is seeing. Um, I, I think I gave the data point before, we did some independent economic modeling um, and at, at a sort of macro level, um, the estimation was that, that putting in these proposals would cost around 17,000 jobs um, and take about a million pounds out of the economy per day at a host level. Um, we also surveyed hosts on Airbnb and just over half of them, 51%, said they would leave the sector um, and, and no longer participate in, this, in the short-term letting sector. I'd also want to just emphasise what Fiona said um, at Airbnb, we have a lot of experience working with local authorities and regulators all around the world to implement registration systems. Be happy to share the detail of that in writing um, post this session. They work, um, they protect uh, communities, they balance the need of, of communities to regulate short-term letting with, with the benefits of tourism, licensing systems. Our experience is they do exactly the opposite and they do cripple tourism sectors. Um, so again, we're very happy to share um, best practices and 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 kind of case studies from where we've worked with reg regulations. That that would be really helpful. Thanks very much. And looking at the the impact which the sector currently is facing um, with the pandemic, um, we've seen in terms of restrictions, but also um, you know the number of tourists, for example, who are coming, um, international tourists, for example, who are coming to the country. Um, where do you think the sector currently is um, in recovering from the pandemic? And with these changes, where do you think the sector kind of um, will be able to um, potentially adapt um, to this, given the time scale? I know a few people have mentioned the fact that the government have moved and tweaked some things on this, uh, but where do you think the, the sector would be able to actually meet the costs and com complexity around the compliance which this would bring to them? I don't know if anyone specifically wants to come in on, on that point. Amanda. Amanda, back to you. On compliance costs, I might I might defer perhaps to, to Fiona or Shomik because we obviously only see a, a slice of the sector. But just to, some thoughts on kind of the tourism recovery and, and where this would leave Scotland as a whole. Just a couple of a couple of points. I mean, I think what, what I can see very clearly in my day, day job is that that this is a competitive market and it's the tourism market is a global market. And effectively um, by implementing these proposals now, what you're doing is basically putting a drag on Scotland's ability to win that business back. And make no mistake about it, DMOs from countries all around the world are very, very aggressively going after that international tourist base that, that by and large isn't quite back to where it was um, pre-pandemic for, for lots of obvious reasons. 
Um, and I think you need only to look at a specific example of that if you look at, at Ireland, which is at the moment um, spending a lot of money, sending a lot of delegations to some of those core um, international markets like the US and really wooing, um, wooing those guests back. Um, I think taking large amounts of supply and, you know, consistently we're hearing around 50% of hosts would, would no longer put their, their properties on the market. Taking that supply out at a time when the sector really needs to put its best foot forward, showcase Scotland, um, enable tourists to actually get to some of these places, particularly rural places where perhaps hotels and traditional hospitality are, are not very well equipped, you know, either either financially um, in terms of the actual feasibility of, of building hotels in these places, removing um, positive sources of supply and tourism accommodation um, feels like a real misstep and, and one that Scotland can kind of ill afford at what, what is a very delicate time in, in a recovery that hasn't happened yet. Thank you for that. And I believe, thank, you. thank you for that. I believe David would like to come in on this and then we'll move to questions from Paul McClellan. Oh, David, and then Fiona, and then questions from Paul McClellan. Thank you. Yes, and uh, w w the question is, where is the sector at the moment in terms of the route, route, route to recovery, and we're a very, very long way away from full recovery, and people talk about two, three, four, even four years for full recovery of our sector. Um, even in, uh, in the B&B, uh, sector across uh, and, and guest house sector across Scotland, uh, there was just under a million visits in 2019 uh, domestic tourism uh, and 0.3 million, 300,000 visits international. Uh, but the international spend was 498 compared with 294 domestic. So the, the percentage, especially in terms of spend, of international tourism is very, very significant. And of course, that's almost completely absent at the moment and is going to take a while to come back and nobody believes it's going to fully come back uh, next year, uh, let alone, um, you know, in, in months. So it's we're talking about years for recovery. And as uh, previous speakers have said, uh, the, a licensing scheme uh, with its long lead time can have a depressive effect on a sector even before it comes in and before people have to be licensed. If they know it's coming, uh, that can have that effect. Thank you. And Fiona, briefly. Thanks very much. Just very briefly, I'm, I'm, I was interested to see that the BRIA says that the tourism sectors will have recovered adequately by March 2023 but the impact of the pandemic is ongoing, it says. I just feel like that's completely unrealistic. And we heard at the Scottish Tourism Alliance last week that Euromonitor believes that we're going to be recovered by about 2026. So ultimately, small accommodation businesses are facing a perfect storm of COVID uncertainty, plus a hugely onerous licensing regime, not to mention the prospect of short-term let control areas. I just feel like we need to support our small businesses through this and minimise the burden, not add to the burden of this completely treacherous, torrid time. Thank you. And I'm going to come back to Miles for another question. Uh, thank you, Convener. Yeah, I, I just wanted to get some more information with regards to um, the benefits which uh, the panel thought would be in place with regards to um, the a, a registration scheme with uh, instead of a, a licensing scheme and specifically around areas which have highlighted concerns to the committee um, around high concentration of short-term lets. Now, I know some of the evidence which um, Airbnb, for example, gave us was around some of the blocking of reservation attempts for younger um, people under 25 years old making entire home bookings. Um, so I wondered, a few of the panel members have touched upon the need to get data um, is that your key benefit you think will provide or do you think some of the outcomes the government are trying to suggest um, can only be achieved within um, licensing could actually be achieved through um, a registration scheme? I'll maybe start with Fiona on that and, and go around. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think the important thing is to try and work out what we're trying to achieve with this licensing scheme. 
Now, if it's data about the scale of an activity, that can absolutely be done by registration. If it's the concern about antisocial behaviour, we already have existing antisocial behaviour legislation. That just needs to be deployed. And we did an FOI um, in July of this year to all of the local authorities. And the instances of antisocial behaviour associated with our sector is absolutely minimal. Now, licensing is not going to help that. There's already existing legislation to deal with that. If we're looking at health and safety, we've already discussed that there's existing health and safety legislation. We just need to ensure that everybody in whatever capacity needs to be adhering to that health and safety legislation. So the, the, the big question is, you know, what are we trying to achieve? Data is always king. Data gives us evidence of who's doing what in each property, but we get that through a registration. And that registration is simpler, less onerous and less burdensome. So I think the register underpins all of the information that we need in order to work out if there are any gaps in legislation. And if there are, how do we achieve that? How do we, how do we fill the gaps? But there's no point in putting a plaster cast across the whole body when actually you just cut your finger with a courgette. Thank you. Thank you for that, Fiona. And I think Shomak would like to come in on this as well. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I just, I think the benefits of registration, I, I just mentioned that I think compliance would be much higher, which means that you'd have a much bigger market and people wouldn't be going underground to do this and because of the fear of not paying a license. Um, if compliance is larger and the market's bigger, you'll have a much bigger tax intake um, from those that are doing it. You'll be able to see which businesses are doing it, which individuals are doing it. They can be taxed appropriately, that income. You know, essentially, with that data, you'll be able to get the, the income that you, um, you know, can then be funneled back into tourism-related activities. Much more income, I suspect, than, um, than through the licensing them itself. Um, so I think th these are other benefits that, that you could get versus a licensing scheme. Thank you for that, Shomak. And I'm going to move to questions from Paul McClellan. Thank you, Convener. Welcome to the panel. And um, like Megan, I just want to refer everyone to my register of interest, I'm a seven councillor on East Lothian Council. Just a couple of points I wanted to pick up. The first one was probably say for yourself, Amanda, um, and then the question you mentioned around about the number of people you reckon would leave the, the industry. And I want to ask you a little bit more around about the methodology, uh, around about that. You mentioned about the number of people would leave, but, but on, on, I suppose, on, on what circumstance? Is that based on, for example, the extra regulation? Is it based on the estimated cost? What, what was, I suppose, the framing of the question on that, which I think is, is really important? Um, and it's, that's probably specific to yourself. And I'm going to ask a little bit more around about the licence and registration in a little second. But that first one, probably for yourself. Sure. I, I mean, I think very simply the question was posed simply as a, um, if the regulations were, were introduced, um, you know, would you continue to let your property on short-term market, would you put it onto the long-term market or would you remove it? Um, and so we got that answer of 51% stating that if the regulations were introduced, they would neither let their property on the short-term nor the long-term rental market, um, which is where that statistic comes from. I think we've obviously, I mean, as I said, I'm constantly in dialogue with our host community in Scotland. And, and you know, to give some colour to, to that sort of quite dry statistic, I think the um, the overall mood is really one of bewilderment, and it is the cost um, that that comes through as as one of the primary concerns. You know, just to put that in context, the average host on Airbnb earns three thousand pounds a year. You know, this is they're not earning sort of tens tens and tens of thousands of pounds. So actually, the, the cost is a, is a meaningful um, has a meaningful impact on their vi the viability of their ability to host. Um, we've also heard concerns about um, compliance, uncertainty. Um, the vast majority of our hosts, in fact, all of our hosts, are, are very happy to um, comply with minimum standards and, and, and laws, as Fiona said. Um, no one believes that, that, that somehow short-term letting providers should opt out from any of these minimum standards, that the concern is really about cost, the concern is that their livelihoods could be taken away from them, that they could be um, that they could be asked, you know, stuck in a holding pattern because a council can't process an application, and in the meantime they can't work. So it's a variety of concerns, but but I think you know it would be disingenuous to suggest that cost isn't isn't one of the main ones. Um, 
Amanda, thanks for that. I mean, it'd be useful. I mean, if, if that methodology could be shared, you know, for, for obviously the committee to look at. The, sure. the, the second point I want to look at is around end about, uh, and it comes back to the, the, base, the basic safety standards, and I suppose at the heart of the licensing scheme, it, you know, it's talking about mandatory basic safety standards, and we've heard, you know, the vast majority of us say of self-catering operators already imply with these standards. I wanted to pick up on a point that, that, that um, Showmac picked up um, earlier on about registration scheme possibly needing some form of accreditation around about safety concerns. Is that not what the licensing scheme would ensure? Showmac, probably coming back to yourself because obviously you made that point and open it up beyond that. Sure. I mean, I think the licensing scheme is very uh, essentially it. You can hear me. Yeah, sorry. Um, it would require an inspection of every property. So each local authority would have to inspect um, each property that is short letting, which we think is very burdensome for people who are obviously all complying with the regulations already typically. And there are, there's, a, there's a better way of doing it, which is essentially, I think we believe through, um, a, you could have a government um, sponsored or uh, accredited provider that allows people to get accredited, which would then be checked. Those who are accredited will be checked for health and safety, making sure that they're complying with um, the standards. And those that are not could be subject to um, checks from time to time, but they're not getting, essentially when at the point of registering, they, will they can declare that they are in compliance with certain different things, electrical safety standards, et cetera, et cetera. And then if at any point further down the line, councils um, believe there may be an issue, then they can obviously go and, and inspect and enforce against them. And that would be a much less burdensome and much less costly system than essentially having to um, only give a license once uh, a property has been inspected, which is um, you know, what's currently being in, um, uh, put forward and, and essentially leads to a much more expensive system than, than otherwise and higher licensing fees than, than otherwise. Thank you. I don't know if anyone else wants to come in on that one. Uh, David and then Amanda. Thank you. Yes, uh, we feel, Mr. McClellan, McClellan that um, a registration scheme would would do all that was needed to allow a uh, proper enforcement of health and safety standards because it would give all the regulators the ability to make risk-based decisions and enforcement action on all of the tourism accommodation that guests are using. At the moment, one of the problem has been, uh, still is, that uh, businesses like traditional B&Bs uh, comply with legislation and are visible and are able to be checked by um, local authorities, by the fire, fire uh, authority. Uh, and other regulators, um, the other kinds of property on uh, platforms effectively aren't able to be checked, although the same rules may apply to them. They're not in, there isn't effective um, checking and inspection ability to happen. With a registration scheme, that would mean there's a database there of the, of the um, properties that are offering accommodation and the fire authorities and others would be able to do their own risk-based uh, enforcement. It doesn't mean, as said earlier by Shomik, that everybody must be expect inspected at the beginning. That's disproportionate and unrealistic and hugely expensive. But it means that the authorities can choose what types of property, what risk-based um, checks they want to do and apply those uh, in a sensible way. So that's how we think registration will be a much more effective and pr proportionate uh, solution than licensing, and particularly better solution for local authorities themselves and their costs and the, uh, the cost to the local communities. Thanks, David. Thank you, David. And then Amanda. Hi, thank you. Just very quickly, um, you know, I, I think, um, I wanted to just point to, I agree with what David said in terms of a registration system being the right way to, um, to achieve health, health and safety measures at Airbnb as a platform. Um, we are highly aligned with all of you in wanting the very, very highest standards of safety 
um, and security um, for our hosts. And, and we spend a lot of time both educating our hosts and, and also doing things like working with providers to, for example, provide free um, carbon monoxide um, fire, fire alarm sort of type things to make sure that we do that. I would, I do just want to point to the, um, the process that landlords in the private rented sector in Scotland use, which is self-attestation. Um, so as part of a registration, hosts would attest to understanding existing health and safety, and safety standards. This works very well in the private sector, and, and we would suggest that it's, it's um, also the most applicable and the most appropriate way of achieving health and safety compliance uh, in the context of short-term letting. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. And we're going to move on to questions from Mark Griffin. Thank you, Kim Gunner. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, a lot of the discussions that I've had over the course of the summer before uh, consideration of the regulations were around um, what is a short-term let, how is a short-term let counted? And I've got concerns about where we are at a starting point for regulations if we don't understand um, the, the volume of short-term lets that we have uh, in the country. The, the government have used the figure of um, 32,000 properties from inside the Airbnb, but um, the non-domestic rate roll only show 18,000 um, properties. And just to ask um, witnesses this morning um, what their view of um, how many short-term lets that there are actually are, how that compares to the, the government's um, figure, and whether um, if that um, figure of 32,000 is out of step with what's actually there, how could that um, affect the starting point for, for these regulations and the impact that they could potentially have? Um, if I could perhaps come first to um, Amanda and then perhaps Shomik. It's, uh, it's always it's always a very dangerous game to try and tie up data sources on the t on the fly, but I'll give it a go. I think fundamentally both of those numbers are probably right, um, and I would suggest that there are two main reasons for the discrepancy. The first is that a um, a lot of hosts on Airbnb in Scotland share a space in their own room, in their own home rather, which may not show up as a it's not a it's not an entire it's not an entire home. It wouldn't necessarily show up as a as a property available to rent. There's also lots of type of supply on Airbnb that's actually not suitable for long-term accommodation. So I'm sure many of the committee will, will have seen there are yurts, there are annexes, there are uh, cabins, there are all sorts of what we call unique supply that, that just isn't appropriate for, for long-term rental. And, and there's a lot of that supply on um, Airbnb. We're very proud of that supply because we think it, it brings unique and something distinctive to Scotland's tourism sector um, but but as I say I think that will I mean we can do the we can do the, the bridge between the two numbers properly after this but I would suggest that they're, they're the reasons for the discrepancy There's, uh, and Fiona would like to come in just, say, just to say that we, we've always had a, a major concern about that figure of 32,000, simply because it is, as you quite rightly say, um, drawn from um, a data scope source from Airbnb. And as Amanda has said, not only is a lot of the stock on Airbnb not suitable for long-term rent, et cetera, et cetera, but also multiple listings and replicated listings. So a five-bedroom house could have seven different listings on Airbnb, for example. So that doesn't necessarily, that 32,000 isn't really reflective of the number of businesses or premises that um, are offering short-term let. There are indeed 18,000 self-catering units on non-domestic rates. Um, there are very few bed and breakfasts on non-domestic rates. But again, what we've said all along is, we need to understand what the scale of the activity is, and you get that from the data provided by a register. So, you know, we shouldn't be using data scraped figures to, to uh, underpin, to, to uh, force through legislation. We need to understand what we're legislating before we introduce licensing. Thank you, Fiona. Any more questions, Mark? Yep, thanks, thanks for those answers. I, I had another question in a, in a different area. So we've touched on... Um, almost the different community responses to short-term um, lets. There are some communities, perhaps in, in Edinburgh, parts of the Highlands, in parts of Fife, who have expressed 
um, real concern um, about the, the number of short term lets in their area. But similarly, in areas like perhaps the south of Scotland, um, where uh, communities have, have expressed real support um, for the economic benefits and would actually like to see the number of uh, short term lets grow. And I know members have uh, witnesses have spoken about wanting to avoid um, varying regulations across the country, but I just wanted to um, ask witnesses again what their view was on potentially a, a pilot project um, looking at an area where communities were looking to see these regulations introduced or actually just wholesale devolving these powers to local authorities so that local authorities can choose where how best to respond to the the needs of their own communities rather than a one-size-fits-all uh, approach um, right across the country. Fiona, I think you want to come in on this, and then David. So, th yes, just very briefly, A, again, going back to the point that licensing is ostensibly about health and safety rather than the number of, so we need to be clear that we're not talking about over-provision because that's already been dealt with by the short-term net control zone legislation. And you're absolutely right. In many parts of the country, people want more. In East Lothian, for example, they actually want more. And, and in the borders, they want more provision because it is the way of the future. It's, it's, it's the accommodation of, um, of that people want now, especially after the pandemic. It's safe. It's welcoming. You're part of the community. You're helping the community. You're benefiting the local providers, the accommodation, the, the activity providers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's not a one size fits all. So, yes, we would absolutely welcome a pilot scheme. We think it would be amazing to have a pilot scheme. But you couldn't just have a pilot scheme in Edinburgh, for example. You'd need to have a pilot scheme and you couldn't necessarily have one in Highlands. You know, but we need to make, you know, be aware that this is not the same situation across the whole of Scotland. So, yes, a pilot scheme would be incredibly welcome. Thank you. And then David and then Amanda. And then we're going to move on to questions from Fergus Ewing. Thank you. I just echo what, uh, what, what Fiona just said. It, it shouldn't be, a, in terms of the, what we're discussing here, a licensing scheme, it, it's, it's about the safety and protection of guests. It shouldn't be about controlling the number of short-term lets in this way. It should be controlling harms and nuisance uh, if those arise. And there are... There are uh, there's existing legislation to control those harms and, and nuisance where, where and when they arise. And, and there are other areas, including pl the planning uh, that is not being discussed this morning, uh, where control can be exercised in that way in specific areas. But in terms of health and safety and what we're talking about here for a licensing scheme, um, that's not a, a route to control sort of numbers. It's a route to ensure that standards are there to protect people. Thank you. And Amanda? Thank you. Um, obviously, echo, echo what David and Fiona said. I also just wanted to pick up on this idea that there's the idea of community and the idea of tourism are somehow kind of irrevocably in conflict. I think one of the, I, I would disagree with that strongly. And I think one of the strengths of the short term um, letting accommodation sector is that it does have such a role to play in dispersing tourism and actually supporting um, supporting communities. You know, in April this year, Airbnb, um, speaking of the south of Scotland, um, actually launched a campaign that was backed by Visit Scotland um, and the Scottish Tourism Alliance. The idea was to shine a spotlight on, you know, an area of the country that is often overlooked in terms of stays and experiences. Now, being able to spread the benefits of tourism to, to less of travelled parts of the company of the country rather ensures that you know both the economic benefits of tourism are felt by all communities, um, and also that that kind of over 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 sort of concentration you, you know is 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 dealt with. So I think it's fallacious to say that the idea of community and the idea of sort of short term rental or um, accommodation are, are always opposed to each other. Um, that said, different parts of the country will have different issues. Um, we are supportive of, of local authorities and councils having the power and the choice to tackle their particular issues in the way that they best see fit. Um, and we do believe that the registration system is the right way to achieve that. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to welcome Fergus Ewing to the committee, Fergus Ewing MSP, 
is joining us. And uh, Fergus, if you have questions for the panel, please uh, do that now. Thank you. Thank you very much, convener, and uh, thank you very much indeed, especially to the four witnesses whose, whose evidence has been comprehensive and, I believe, persuasive and compelling. I have some specific points that I wanted to pursue, convener, with your leave. First of all is to um, ask um, David Weston about the um, fire and safety provisions which apply to the operation of bed and breakfast premises. Um, and is it the case that there already is uh, a, a, a well-established and successful set of uh, guidance which operates to protect customers of B&B &B, and that it has operated for some years now following introduction when I was the tourism minister without incident? Yes, thank you for your question, Mr Ewing. And the answer is yes, yes, there is a very, very well-established uh, regime for fire safety where um, responsible persons, as it's they, they're called, who are responsible for the safety of accommodation, uh, are required um, to do a fire risk assessment. Um, that is a proportionate uh, piece of legislation, which is a sort of self-assessment, self as it were, that, that they can, must look at the fire safety of their premises and put in place appropriate uh, fire precautions, then those can be uh, inspected and checked by the uh, fire authorities. And if the fire authorities don't think they're up to, that they, they are um, sufficient, they can take action. Uh, the problem uh, has arisen with uh, the growth of uh, platforms offering uh, temporary accommodation, which uh, are less visible to uh, um, regulators. So it has been, in effect, more um, difficult, if not impossible, to to um, enforce that that legislation in the same way. Hence, the requirement for a registration scheme, which would level that playing field and simply say that. Um, here is the list of all the tourism accommodation, and the regulators would be able to extend their risk-based uh, enforcement action to all tourism accommodation uh, in the same way. Um, they would they would have a, a lot more um, a lot more inspection to do, but that would be only right that uh, all the accommodation would be subject to inspection and it would be risk-based and proportionate. As, as has been said before, it doesn't mean that every uh, bit of tourism accommodation must be inspected every year. Of course not. But the fire authorities have very well established ways of deciding how much inspection they think needs to be done. They can concentrate it in certain high-risk areas. They can do random inspections, but they must at least, as a starting point, as a minimum, they must know which are the identities of the responsible people for uh, for each piece of uh, accommodation that get paying guests are going to stay in. May, may I ask the question, out of fairness to the other witnesses, to say how they believe um, the guests of people in Airbnb and self-catering properties uh, are, if you like, um, sufficiently well catered for in respect of fire safety. Fergus, Amanda would like to come in on this. Thank you. Thank you, Fergus. Um, look, from, from our perspective, as I've said before, safety is absolutely one of the pillars of our, our host community. Um, we spend a lot of time educating our hosts um, around you know, what, what those standards are. Obviously, every Airbnb host in Scotland um, is already subject to, for example, fire safety regulations, um, and those existing regulations are there. Um, I would say um, that that risk-based approach is really, really important. Someone who is sharing a spare room in their home clearly has to take safety precautions. What those steps will look like might be different from someone who's operating an entire premises as a tourism accommodation business. Um, we also... Um, I, I just wanted to point out as well, as a platform, we are very, very proactive in ourselves removing 
um, hosts who don't comply with standards. We can and we, we do do that all the time. We also have a, a one of the best, I would say, inspection systems in the world, which is we have our wonderful Airbnb guests who are also very vocal about reporting instances where they feel things um, are kind of not up to scratch. Um, just to round out, you, you know, as I said, that risk-based approach is important. We believe that the self-attestation um, contained in a registration system is the way to go in the first instance, but we are um, proactive, supportive um, partners in, in driving up safety standards. It's a core, a core part of what we do as a business. Thank, thank you very much. I also wanted, convener to ask just how a registration scheme um, might operate in practice, because I think we did hear at the outset that each of the four witnesses all supported a registration scheme, and indeed they've referred to schemes operating in other countries in the world. I know Fiona Campbell mentioned that she first proposed this in 2017, and I believe that she has had engagement about how such a scheme might work. So I wonder if it might be appropriate to ask Fiona Campbell to start off with how such a scheme would work uh, and in what way it, it would deliver benefits uh, as opposed to the licensing scheme which the Scottish Government uh, are proposing. Thank you very much indeed. Good question. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we've, as I said before, we've got evidence of best practice from across the, the, the world um, uh, that registration systems work. It's akin to the private landlord's register, which again is a self-certification scheme largely complying with existing legislation. So what we imagine is that this could be delivered by the Development of Tourism Act. We can give you much more detail on this afterwards. It is quite detailed. Um, we're not proposing that our scheme is infallible. It obviously needs to be looked at by the Scottish Government and make sure the Scottish Government lawyers are, um, are happy with it. But it could be delivered right now, pretty much. And, and we believe that whilst we believe that it will be, bring real benefits tourism in Scotland, whereas licensing will be hugely detrimental to tourism and licensing. And those are two diametrically opposed positions. But we genuinely believe that registration is a targeted and proportionate um, solution to the policy objectives that the Scottish Government has. And we think that they can be achieved really quite easily looking at the private landlords register. I, thank you. I mean, there's I have many other questions, but I'd just like to just have one more, if I may, convener, because I appreciate time is short. Uh, and I have been in lengthy correspondence with the Minister about all of these matters and others. But um, I think I'm correct, and perhaps this, this again is a question that Fiona Campbell may be best able to respond to, that at the outset, the purpose of the regulations appear to be primarily, or even solely, to deal with um, anti-social behaviour, which was perceived to arise from the use of tenemental flatted properties in the city of Edinburgh for party purposes. And I may say that in my constituency, very large properties used for such as stag parties and so on also occasion concern or on occasion about anti-social behaviour. However, the question I wanted to, to address is this. Um, first of all, does Fiona Campbell believe that the Scottish Government no longer uh, see these regulations as playing a role here? And secondly, is it not the case that there already is existing powers uh, and legislation under the Antisocial Behaviour Notices, Houses Used for Holiday Purposes, Scotland Order 2011, which provide local government with the powers to tackle precisely this antisocial behaviour? In other words, there already are regulations which enable uh, local authorities to act uh, uh, where, where there are serious cases, convener, of antisocial behaviour. I wonder if Fiona Campbell might be um, first offered this question, and if other witnesses have a views, I'd be very interested to hear their evidence too. Thank you. Thanks Fiona. very much. You're absolutely... Yep, go ahead, sorry. Sorry, thank thanks so much. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That, um, one of the issues identified in the 2017 and then 2019 research done by Indigo House was antisocial behaviour. And I absolutely concur there is existing legislation in place that covers that um, particular mischief. Now, the other problem is that going back to the 2019 piece of research, there was also issues to do with housing, there was to do with Basically, the problem is there's been many different issues conflated here. And as a result, this piece of legislation 
has ended up with an element of mission creep. Um, and we're not sure actually what the purpose of the legislation has ended up being. Is it about health and safety? Is it about housing? Is it about antisocial behavior? And I suppose that's why it's become quite so complicated. There is existing legislation to cover health and safety. There is now existing legislation to cover the over provision of short term lets. Um, there is existing legislation in existence to cover antisocial behaviour. Perhaps we should start looking at those and how those are working and whether those need to be tweaked rather than introducing legislation for the sake of legislation. Thank you for that, Fiona. And I believe Amanda would like to come in on this as well. Um, I, I think I just wanted to, I would echo everything that Fiona said and, and add, add to that um, just to make the point around by trying to tackle antisocial behaviour through this legislation, you effectively um, put a blanket kind of uniform imposition across Scotland. Um, our view is that any kind of measures to handle that, that kind of behaviour should be at the discretion of councils, as indeed it is today. I just also did want to make the point on antisocial behaviour. Um, you know, from an Airbnb perspective, we take it very seriously. Uh, we are very much aligned with local authorities in terms of wanting wanting it all gone. We, we can and do remove bad actors all the time. Um, we block uh, reservation attempts all the time um, that prevent under 25 year olds from making entire home bookings in their local neighborhoods. So trying to crack down on those party houses. We have new technology um, that basically identifies high risk reservations. Um, and again, sort of that, that technology is aimed at preventing people who are likely to be wanting to, to, to let properties to have parties to stop them from doing that. We suspend um, listings all the time. We suspended a thousand listings across the UK um, in recent months following a crackdown on sort of so-called party houses. Uh, we have a neighbour support line. That means anyone in the neighbourhood can contact Airbnb directly. Um, with concerns about a suspected listing, and we, we can and do again take actions against those suspicious listings. All of these things are, are things that we as a platform and as a, as a participant in the community can and do do, and we continue to make those technologies and those services better. Um, we acknowledge that, um, that, that sometimes there is a need for you know, councils themselves to take action. We work very closely with local authorities when we are notified about these bad actors. But this legislation um, is, is not legislation that's going to tackle antisocial behaviour. It's, it's not the right route. Thank you, Amanda. And I believe that we have come to the end of our, of our questions this morning. And I just want to thank the panel for joining us to give evidence on this, on this issue. And I'm going to now suspend to allow the witnesses to leave. <laughs>
The third item on our agenda today is consideration of the Town and Country Planning General Permitted Development Coronavirus Scotland Amendment Number 2, Order 2021. This is a negative instrument and there is no requirement on the committee to make any recommendations on it. I'd like to ask committee members if anyone has any comments. Nobody has any comments. Um, does the committee... Uh, does the committee agree that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument? Agreed. Okay, thank you. And now we're going to move into private. As agreed earlier in the meeting, we will consider item four in private, and I now close the public part of the meeting, and we will move into private.